I'm Mikey Diaz. Welcome to The Transcript. This week, the folks at The Transcript revisit the new way to take MCAS, get pitching with Hamped Up, and go back in time at the Amherst College Natural History Museum. Hi, I'm Alexa Colley. Over the weekend, an ethnic-based attack took on Mali. Gunmen targeted Fulani villagers, killing over 150 people and reportedly burning women and children in their homes. First responders report at least one-third of the victims were children. The mostly Muslim Fulani community is frequently targeted because some accuse them of being tied to jihadist organizations. The UN and International Crime Court says they're sending teams to the West African country to investigate this weekend's massacre. Fifty women are suing a software company Salesforce for allegedly helping a website facilitate sex trafficking. The women identify themselves as survivors of sex trafficking and abuse through Backpage. Salesforce said it takes the accusations very seriously. Yesterday, Facebook says it's banning content that promotes white nationalism and white supremacy on its site and on Instagram. This change is expected to take effect next week. Hi, I'm Amelia Tamayo. Civil rights activist and founder of the Me Too movement, Tarana Burke, spoke at Smith College last week. Nice. In other news... Would you like to travel back in time without the risks? Amherst College's Manaski Museum of Natural History is a local treasure where you can do just that. Take a step into the museum to experience dramatic fossils, extraordinary dinosaur footprints, and geological specimens that tell the history of our local landscape over time, and dazzling mineral specimens from all over the universe. The museum is one of the largest in New England with over 1,700 specimens on display. Your visit will challenge you to consider problems of scientific interpretation. And since it's free of charge to enter, we went down to Amherst to check it out for ourselves. We have probably close to 40,000 people visit the museum each year. One of the purposes of the museum is community outreach. I mean, the whole intent of a good part of the museum was to help people understand the local geology from the time before Pangaea formed through the period of the formation of Pangaea, which means when mountains were being built, to a time when the whole of Pangaea began to split apart, um, creating the, the valley at that time. Let's take a look at some of the impressive exhibits that this museum has to offer. Well, what we're looking at now is a painting of the Connecticut River Valley today, albeit without houses, cars, um, so they've been stripped from the painting so that the painting could represent kind of what it would look like were it to be a natural environment. So what you see in the painting that's here is you'll see the mountains that are in the foreground, well, that would be the Mount Tom, the Holyoke Range. Some of those rocks are actually located right in front of me. In, in this particular rock we have some Granby basaltic tuff, or Holyoke basalt, or Hitchcock volcanics. All of these are rocks that would have been part of the rifting of the valley. And we look further down and we go back further in time to rocks that are metamorphic, rocks that have gone through a mountain building process, which would have been when Pangaea was forming. And as we look further, we can find rocks that are related to some of the more glacial events. But it's a really a wonderful painting. This is an example of a tra trackway that was found pretty darn close to Northampton, Massachusetts. It helps us to understand what was going on in the Connecticut River Valley some 200 million years ago. Beautiful mud that was just laid out there, it was perfectly flat, just, you know, just perfect, you know, just had come off a of stream deposition, some nice silt, and it was sitting there. It was beginning to dry out a little bit, and then all of a sudden, literally out of nowhere, there's this loud crack of thunder, just like, boom! And then the rain comes pelting down, and going, hitting the mud, going, and as it hits the mud, it begins to form these craters. And not only do we know that the craters are being formed by the rain, but the rain is actually has a direction to it. It's not only coming down, but it's coming at an angle, suggesting the wind was blowing in this direction, the rain was coming down, and it was doing that. All the while that was happening, some little critter was in his cave and looked out and said, hey, I'm going to go for a little walk. And started walking through the mud, kind of dragging his tail behind him as he moved off into the distance. 
had it kept raining, all of this would have been washed away, but it didn't. The rain had to stop very quickly. And it stopped quickly, the clouds parted, it got really hot, you can just imagine it's steamy, and all of a sudden the water's evaporating, kind of like as it evaporates off the mud, dries it out, there's a little bit of a coating of some kind of a slime, because it's that slimy mud, and that slime dies. Wow, what a breathtaking museum. But don't take my word for it, it's free of charge and open Tuesday through Sunday. Go on your own field trip to find out. Thanks for watching. I'm Amelia Tamayo, and this has been In Other News. Bye. Hi, I'm Gabe Nicotera. Welcome to Hamped Up. Y'all ready for this? Last year, the girls' softball team lost six key seniors, including now D3 catcher Abigail Pilas. This season, Caitlin Romdith is taking over, so I interviewed her about her role behind the plate. Um, I'm personally not nervous. I mean, Marissa's been like practicing over the off season, and I've been practicing over the off season. And everyone's been like playing fall ball and stuff. So I think that we're re really pumped up for the season to begin. I mean, we do have a lot of seventh and eighth graders, but like they're working hard, and during tryouts they've been working really hard. So I think we're gonna be okay. I think there is an advantage having the coach uh, have a catcher who previously played because she came to practices and she started helping me and she's been helping me through my stance and stuff. So I think that that's useful. The girls also have a new pitcher on the mound this year. So I caught up with Marissa Lynn Batterini where she gave me a pitching lesson. So as we know, Anna Kerwood, the varsity pitcher the last four years, went off to play D3 softball. And now you're the pitcher this year. So what's it like being thrown into the biggest position on the field? Um, I guess I kind of expected it because I was a backup pitcher my three years of varsity softball. But um, it's not, I wouldn't call it my ideal position. I would like to be playing my senior year, but I'm ready to see what this season is going to turn out like. If you could pick one of last year's teammates to fail senior year and have another season, who would it be? Um, easily Anna Kerwood. And why is that? Because she's probably one of the best pitchers in Western Mass and I would really enjoy if she could pitch this season. And as for the team goes this year, what do you think your strength and weakness is? I would say that our strength is probably that it might not directly affect us this year, but we have a lot of younger kids who are going to be coming up and they'll be able to like build up the program because we only have five upperclassmen within the whole softball program. Um, so the younger kids are really going to have to step up and I think they've been working really hard. So they're probably our strength along with like our core group of girls that we already have. And our weakness, um, Probably just that we're going to have to rebuild like our team chemistry again because we always had the same group since we were in like kindergarten and that's changed this year. So we're definitely going to have to work on like working as a whole unit. I guess my last question is do you think you can give me just a quick pitching lesson? Of course. First you want to step onto the mound and you want your feet to be a little staggered like this. So your left foot is going to be forward and your right foot's going to be a little bit farther behind it. Yep. Okay, and then you're going to bring your hands together. And then you're kind of going to go up in your toes a little bit to get some power. And then you're going to spring, start bringing your arms up. And then as you bring your arms up, you're going to twist <laughs> into a K. And then you're going to come down here into an I. Yep. And then you're going to finish together. And you're going to, yeah, but when you do it, you like want to really like bring it, tuck your body <laughs> close. Like you want to, <laughs> yes, yeah, there you go. It's a follow through. Yeah, the that's what it is. Through. Do you mind if I try? Yeah, go for it. Yep. Arms up. Arms up. Twist. And now we're going to start bringing your leg out. Yep. Arm above your head. Yep. Yep. Now come to this land. All right, yep. Strike. Strike. <laughs> yeah. The softball team's first game is next Tuesday, April 2nd in East Hampton. Thanks for watching Hamped Up. I'm Gabe Nicotera. Hi, I'm Keely Hunter Gasparini, and welcome back to Tell It Like It Is. Since the dawn of time, otherwise known as third grade, we students have been plagued by the standardized test of Massachusetts, the MCAS. This year, our sophomores have experienced a change in the way they take their final year of the English MCAS. 
Though it's been a long time coming, NHS has now accepted modern computerized test taking with open arms. I got to talk to Mr. John Provost, Northampton Public Schools Superintendent, to learn about why our schools have made the move toward a more technologically advanced test taking procedure. The Department of Education has been in the process of transitioning all schools to MCAS for the past three years. So the first grades that um, participated in computer-based MCAS testing were the middle school grades. Those were two years ago. I also got to meet with Ms. Kate Jobson to understand what it meant to make the switch to computers, especially in regards to training the teachers on the new way of testing. So it was my responsibility to train teachers on how to use the platform and how to administer a test online. So I think it, com it comes down to preference. Some people prefer taking it online. I think for some people the, the reading on the computer for that extended period of time can be difficult um, and other people prefer it that way. Get a good night's sleep the night before and don't worry too much about the testing. You've been well prepared by your teachers and just go out there and do your best and everything will be fine. So sophomores, make sure to get some sleep and freshmen, good luck in the coming future. May the Wi-Fi be fast and the keyboard's not sticky. Happy Friday! Thanks for watching. Come see Samuel Beckett's Waiting for Gatto, directed by myself, in the Black Box Theater tonight at 7 p.m. and tomorrow at 2 and 7 p.m. I would also like to thank every member of the transcript for their hard work and dedication these past few weeks while I have been at rehearsal. The transcript would not be what it is without you. You all mean the world to me. Keep up the good work, and thank you. Mm -hmm.